Singapore may be a little red dot, but our reach is global. Many local companies have expanded beyond our shores, broadening their footprint across the globe. Given today's fast-changing global economic climate, companies should consider venturing overseas to capture new opportunities, enhance business competitiveness, and achieve sustainable growth. Internationalization is a journey, starting from identifying the right market for expansion, to strengthening your capabilities, to taking that first step into the market. However, the journey is not always smooth sailing. Along the way, you will need the right resources and support. Help is at hand. Introducing Global Connect at SBF, the partner for Singapore companies looking to go global. Regardless of your internationalization journey, Global Connect at SBF can help. Established with the support of Enterprise Singapore, backed by an extensive network of partners globally, Global Connect at SBF delivers a comprehensive suite of services to support you on your journey. Join the other Singapore companies who had successfully expanded overseas. Embark on that journey now. Contact Global Connect at SPF today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board the journey to internationalization. For companies who are keen to venture overseas, Global Connect at SPF is here to partner you along this exciting journey. Be it about identifying the right market for expansion, or strengthening your capabilities or taking your first step into the market, Global Connect at SPF can help in the following areas. Internationalization advisory, market information, business matching, capability development, and in-market facilitation. Our friendly market advisors are readily available to help you along this journey. Reach out to them for a complimentary discussion today. Together, we can make your internationalization journey comes true. Thank you. Singapore may be a little red dot, but our reach is global. Many local companies have expanded beyond our shores, broadening their footprint across the globe. Given today's fast-changing global economic climate, companies should consider venturing overseas to capture new opportunities, enhance business competitiveness, and achieve sustainable growth. Internationalization is a journey, starting from identifying the right market for expansion, to strengthening your capabilities, to taking that first step into the market. However, the journey is not always smooth sailing. Along the way, you will need the right resources and support. Help is at hand. Introducing Global Connect at SBF, the partner for Singapore companies looking to go global. Regardless of your internationalization journey, Global Connect at SBF can help. Established with the support of Enterprise Singapore, backed by an extensive network of partners globally, Global Connect at SBF delivers a comprehensive suite of services to support you on your journey. Join the other Singapore companies who had successfully expanded overseas. Embark on that journey now. Contact Global Connect at SBF today. Ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon, everyone. Please take note of the following housekeeping issues. Please note that this webinar is meant for general information only and does not contain or convey any legal or other advice. 
all efforts have been taken to ensure that the information provided is accurate as of publication date. Please note that the organizer and speakers reserve all rights in the materials provided. If you have any questions during any segment of the webinar, please utilize the Q&A function. We will try our best to answer as many questions as possible. But for the uh, questions that we are unable to answer today, we will work with the panelists and email the responses to the attendees post-webinar. As such, in order for us to attribute the questions to the right attendees, please indicate your name and company in your Zoom profile. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeffrey from SBF, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third episode of SPF IC webinar. The topic for today is mediation and arbitration as means to resolve COVID-19 related disputes in infrastructure projects. For today, we are very honored to have three esteemed guests to join our webinar. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Colin Chow. He is the director for the Civil and Legislative Policy Division from the Ministry of Law and is responsible for supervising and managing teams that develop policy and introduce legislative reforms. He is involved in the development for the COVID-19 Temporary Measure, Measures Act and as such ex is extremely knowledgeable about the new act. Next, we have Ms. Mich Michelle Chiam from the Singapore International Arbitration Center with us today. Michelle is the Deputy Cent Center Director for the Center and is responsible for the design, development, and conduct of training programs. She also handles the corporate communications and coordinates the business development activities for SIAC. Lastly, I would like to introduce Mr. Tae-Ju Lin from the Singapore International Mediation Center. Julin has a long history in the legal circuit in Singapore. Prior to SIMC, Julin was part of the team in the Ministry of Law involved in the development of the Mediation Act 2017. He was also involved in the development of the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which was eventually adopted in December 2018. Now I would like to give a brief overview of the program for the day. We will be having four segments for our webinar. First, Michelle will be presenting on arbitration for the COVID-19 related disputes in infrastructure projects. Next, Julie will be sharing on the new SIMC's COVID-19 protocol, which is an expedited economical and effective dispute resolution method. Following that, Colleen will be giving a summary on the COVID-19 Act, as well as sharing a case study on its application. Our final segment for today will be a panel discussion on understanding arbitration, mediation, and COVID-19 Act. Without further ado, I would like to invite Michelle to present. Michelle, please. Thank you, Jeffrey. Let me see if I can get the slides going. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to SBF for inviting me to speak today. Um, what I'm going to do today is to give you an overview of SIAC um, and so that even after COVID-19 um, passes, you can also use the, the mechanisms that we have in the SIAC used to resolve your disputes efficiently and economically. For those of you who are familiar with SIAC, um, this might be elementary, but um, let me just give you a quick overview of what SIAC is um, SIAC commenced operations in 1991. We are a relatively young institution. However, in the 2018 Queen Mary University of London survey, we were ranked the third in the world behind ICC and LCIA, and was the, which makes us the top in Asia. Um, this is an this is an, a remarkable achievement for a relatively young institution, and also, and the reason why we are able to progress so quickly is is because we have been able to benefit from Singapore's trusted legal system and um, the reputation for neutrality and, and uh, 
providing a, a trusted legal system that will help parties to resolve their disputes. So in 2019, we had 479 new cases. Uh, more than 80% of these were international cases. The parties were from 49 jurisdictions. And um, SIC awards have been enforced in many jurisdictions, including China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Thailand. Um, you will notice that some of these are also parties that are often involved in construction. Hence, um, later in the future, when you do negotiate your new contracts with your, your opposing side, you might want to raise this as a point for, for saying why SIAC should actually be included in your construction contract. Last year, uh, we had 479 new cases. And of this 479 new cases, 16% were construction cases. Um, this shows our top 10 foreign users in 2019. Um, the most, the, the most pop, the top foreign user was India, followed by Philippines, China, USA, Brunei, UAE, Indonesia. So what SIC does is, uh, we are basically an arbitral institution, and what we do is we administer arbitration cases that are submitted to us. We will assist with the appointment of arbitration uh, arbitrators when the parties are unable to agree, and we will supervise and monitor the progress of the case. We will and more importantly, at the end of the arbitration, we'll have to scrutinize the draft awards to ensure that, um, uh, the, to minimize the, the risk of errors and to increase the profitability of your, these awards. However, we'll not touch the substance of the award. So when, what the secretary will do is they'll review the award. And if there are any um, errors, they'll point this out to the, the tribunal. And if there are any logic issues as well with the draft award, um, which might take place if, for example, you have a sole arbitrator who, um, does, uh, who is just drafting the award on its own, um, the secretary will also point this out to the tribunal for its consideration. Especially for, SI, uh, for construction disputes, uh, SIC's panel has over 100 experienced arbitrators uh, in the areas of en uh, energy, engineering, procurement, and construction from more than 25 jurisdictions. And what we have is a rigorous appointment process where parties, uh, arbitrators who want to be appointed to our panel have to have at least 10 years PQE, fellowship accreditation, um, acted as arbitrator at least five cases and written at least two awards. So last year, um, of the 297 appointments that um, SIC made, 104 were from Singapore, and um, about 36% were non Singaporean and who were appointed by SIC. And of 25% were non Singaporean arbitrators nominated by parties. So now I'll go on to the time and cost saving measures that you can use for, for your arbitration case. Um, so from the, after the, after you file your notice of arbitration, you have, what you can use is the emergency arbitrator mechanism. And what this will do is allow you to apply for emergency interim relief prior to the constitution of the tribunal. And of, this is a popular measure for construction cases and 13% uh, were, were of cases last year were actually from construction cases. And the types of relief commonly sought for emergency arbitrator cases would include, in the in case of construction cases, um, bank, a stay on the call on bank guarantees until the final determination by the tribunal. as well as freezing injunctions to prevent the dissipation of assets. And what SIC offers is a, a very quick system where um, once you file the notice of arbitration and you pay the requisite fees, your emergency arbitrator will be appointed within one day. And following that, once it, the emergency arbitrator is appointed, the interim order of what must be actually made within 14 days from appointment. And what we did in the 2016 rules was to change the one working day requirement to one calendar day, which means that if you file, uh, if unfortunately you, the other side files the application on a Friday, your emergency arbitrator will be appointed by Saturday. And so this mechanism has actually been used by parties um, on the eve of Christmas or Chinese New Year, just so that um, to give the other side a nice present for the holidays. There is actually a high rate of voluntary compliance in practice for emergency arbitrator um, awards. And under the International Arbitration Act in Singapore, EA orders and awards are enforceable in Singapore seated arbitrations and arbitrations seated outside Singapore. And the shortest time between the hearing of, of an emergency arbitrator application and the, and the request for measure 
and the, the issuance of the award is actually one day. So since the 20, since we introduced this emergency arbitrator application in 2010, we have had 106 applications in total, um, and 34 have been granted. Moving on to expedited procedure, um, what, this is also very useful for lower, lower um, cases with lower sums in dispute and where the dispute is less complex. So if your sum in dispute is less than six million Sing Singapore dollars, and if there is a case of exceptional urgency, you can actually apply for expedited procedure. And the advantage of this is that um, after the so arbitrator is appointed, the award will be issued within six months. Um, since the, this mechanism was introduced in the 2010 rules, we've had 165 applications and about half, more than half have been um, accepted. Early dismissal. So in terms of COVID-19 um, disputes, this, or we foresee an increase in early dismissal applications because what parties might try to argue is that um, their COVID-19 dispute, um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it, also, um, it, co it constitutes a force measure event which would actually make um, the other party's claim or defense manifestly without legal merit. So the advantage of this mechanism is to allow parties to strike, apply to strike out the other party's claim or defense early on in the proceedings. Um, this is actually, a, a, you want actually one of the first commercial arbitral institutions to introduce this procedure. Um, prior to this, um, this mechanism was only this mechanism was only um, available in investment arbitration cases under the exit rules. After SIC introduced this procedure, um, other arbitral institutions still followed suit, and, and this mechanism is now um, found in a number of arbitral, arbitral rules. Consolidation and joinder. Um, as you will know, that construction complex um, disputes are very complex, and um, there are multiple parties with subcontractors and um, architects and designers and um, just suppliers. So what this will allow you to do is instead of filing one notice of arbitration for each of your dispute, you can actually consolidate the, the related arbitrations into one, one arbitration. And if the, the court of arbitration or the tribunal agrees with you, the various arbitrations can be heard in one, one consolidated arbitration. Alternatively, if um, there's a party that related party that should that you you feel should be joined because he um, he played a key role in the dispute, you can also apply to join him under the rule seven. Of the SIC rules. So multiple contracts actually work in line with um, the joint and consolidation provisions and allow you to have related arbitrations or related um, parties joined in one arbitration to save time and costs. Um, the app met up protocol. So uh, I think Julie might touch on this later on. So what SIAC and SIMC have done is to provide this protocol to parties where in order for them um, to take advantage of the New York Convention, which allows um, parties to enforce their award in more than 160 countries, this protocol causes parties to first file an arbitration and then their arbitration will be stayed and then the matter will be referred to the SIMC and the matter will be mediated. And in the event that the mediation is successful, parties will actually be able to um, record their, their mediated settlement agreement in a consent award that is enforceable under the New York Convention. And the reason why we want to take advantage of the New York Convention is because there are over 160 signatories to the New York Convention, um, which is currently more than the Singapore mediation, the con Singapore Convention on Mediation. Um, I've reached the end of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask um, at the Q&A function and we'll, I will try to address it later on in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the informative presentation on SIAC's uh, arbitration.
and how this may be utilized by companies to resolve um, their contractual issues. Next, I would like to invite Julene to share on the new SIMC's COVID-19 protocol. Julene, please. Thanks, Jeffrey, and thanks, Michelle. Um, so thanks, Jeffrey, for the very kind introduction just now. So um, just a very brief background about myself. So uh, my name is Julin. Uh, I'm a public sector lawyer with the Singapore Legal Service. And uh, I've uh, served at AGC Supreme Court as a law clerk, uh, where I um, assisted in cases that uh, included uh, construction disputes, performance bonds, contracts, and so on. And um, uh, I then went on to the Ministry of Law. Uh, where I was um, involved in um, part of a team that helped to reform the uh, Singapore's dispute resolution frameworks, uh, including Mediation Act and the Singapore Convention on Mediation. So um, this year, I'm at SIMC, and um, maybe today I can uh, explain a little bit about what SIMC does, um, really to promote mediation and uh, explain how you can use mediation to resolve disputes, especially disputes that have occurred during this period. And uh, as I'm see, we're looking at cases uh, that are commercial, that uh, quite often, very often, there's an international element to it. And uh, I understand that in, the, in this industry, uh, there is uh, some level of cross-border element. So um, maybe you can take a step back and uh, we can um, talk about what is mediation. So uh, there's no better way for me to uh, explain mediation than perhaps by uh, referring you to the picture that you see now. Um, so what do you see? I think uh, I'll try to orientate you a little bit. On the left, you see the mediators. These are neutrals. And around the table, uh, these are actually lawyers and parties. And what you are seeing now is a, a, a real life scene uh, with permission, of course, uh, of an actual dispute that's being mediated. And you can see that uh, there are multiple parties and they're all around a round table and uh, some are logging remotely, and uh, it's all behind closed doors. And um, with that, maybe I can go into some of the features of mediation. So you saw the parties earlier, right? So I think that if I were to explain mediation, the best way to consider mediation is that everything is about what you want as parties. You have complete control over whether you want to mediate, whether you want to settle, who you pick as a mediator, and uh, if you want to settle and resolve the dispute, whether you are happy with the terms that you have agreed on. So uh, there's almost complete uh, party-centric and uh, autonomy involved. So we call it control. And uh, I think the question that we often get from uh, people who are being exposed to this uh, way to resolve disputes for the first time is, why is the secret sauce? What's so special about mediation uh, that make it a success? And uh, I think one important factor is the mediator. And uh, so it's quite different from uh, just negotiating in the project room, for example, or in the meeting room. You have a mediator who's an expert neutral, but he's not a judge. He's not an arbitrator. He's somebody who's very skilled at process, at communication, at psychology, to talk to you and talk to the other parties and uh, try to help you all to find ways to resolve the dispute. And that takes me to the process. And uh, there's some very important points here about mediation. So um, it's not anything goes. There's a particular structure to it. So in the picture that you saw earlier, there was a particular stage where people were going through their opening statements. So you do have your say. And uh, for example, unlike going to court, uh, sometimes in mediation is not uncommon for the parties to uh, explain where they're coming from and uh, speak about the problem and what they see as the solution and so on of course, with their lawyers present in commercial mediation. And uh, I think a very important point is this. For mediation, everything is confidential. It's behind closed doors, okay? So if you don't settle, that's okay. Uh, when you go to court next time or arbitration, you cannot use the details that are discussed during the mediation uh, in the future proceedings, and that's important. And there are two other points here that uh, throughout the course of my presentation, I will explain to you. And uh, it's very creative because uh, you can agree on solutions that are beyond just pay me money or pay you money and how much. You can go beyond contractual remedies. And uh, most importantly, during this period, 
it is uh, not expensive and uh, it's also very fast. And I'll go on to show why. Uh, but maybe I'll take a step back and uh, I can explain a little bit about SIMC. Um, we are not so uh, uh, old. We have been around for maybe about five years, not for profit. And uh, we're really born as a result of a, a report on how to uh, uh, update Singapore as an international commercial mediation center. And so we were launched in uh, 2014. And uh, just very briefly on our services. So our main bread and butter is of course the mediation. So if you have a dispute, uh, you may go to your lawyer, then your lawyer may come to us, or you may come directly to us, and uh, we'll then uh, maybe speak to the other party. We can arrange for a venue, uh, help you to select a mediator, and then we proceed to mediate your dispute for you. And uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, one other service that we offer uh, is hybrid mode of dispute resolution. That really is uh, mixing and matching. So we mix like arbitration with mediation and you get the best of both worlds. So you get the best of arbitration. For example, if you want a ruling, you want an award, then you want the best of mediation. For example, you want it to be uh, very flexible. You want it to be uh, very, uh, in a way, more informal. You can choose to uh, use up, met up, for example. And the details of this uh, is on our website. And uh, lastly, we are also uh, an authorized appointing body. For, uh, you may know about this, the Singapore Infrastructure Dispute Management Protocol. So this really is a new trend in dispute resolution, where we're not looking at trying to fight the fire after the fire has come up. We are looking at trying to find ways of dispute prevention and management. So in these things, um, for example, in the PSSCOC, uh, uh, in optional module, we have this clause where parties can agree to appoint a dispute board. And they really are like friends of the parties. They work with you uh, from the very start. They check in with you for regular site visits so that before a dispute actually uh, really happens and blows out of control, uh, they are there to help to manage it. So we do that as well. Maybe I'll go into a little bit about our cases, right? So we have more than 100 cases to date and uh, they are mostly quite high value, high stakes commercial disputes. And um, I think earlier I spent some time uh, trying to explain the benefits of mediation. Fast, not expensive. Uh, it's also something that's very flexible, very creative, and uh, in a way, it's something that allows you to say uh, what you really want and uh, negotiate with the mediator there. And uh, against all these benefits, you know, it actually works very well. In our experience, about seven to eight in 10 of cases succeed in settling. And uh, think about it. You get all the benefits and it's also very effective. And uh, is SIMC, SMC, I think we all have like quite similar high rates for mediation. Sectors covered, uh, that's quite a common question that we get. And uh, the answer is that uh, for mediation, we cover almost every sector, including infrastructure and construction. So maybe now I can go into a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and how it's impacted on mediation. So the background is this. I, I think that in the past few years, mediation has become something that's more recognized and more useful to businesses. But I think during this pandemic, uh, it's resulted in something that's very unprecedented. There are quite a lot of challenges. And as a result, we see mediation as being more important during this period. During this period where, I mean, manpower, machinery, materials, money, uh, there are so many choke points in the supply chain. So how do you try to you know, um, release all these choke points and try to get back to uh, your real business operations as smoothly as possible? And to us, uh, using mediation right now is even more important. Why? So the first reason is that you can resolve quickly without too much dent on the pocket. And it's also very effective. Seven to eight in 10 of our disputes end up stuck in the settlement agreement. And you can also shift from a win-lose approach. If you go to court, for example, somebody is going to win, somebody is going to lose. Sometimes you win some, you lose some. But in mediation, it's actually possible to go beyond that into a win-win approach. And uh, what do I mean by this? Um, give you an example, right? So uh, we had one case uh, where it was a case where somebody stole materials, stole a good from a factory belonging to this company and try to sell it online uh, illegally, of course. So uh, this person was, of course, sued by the company. 
but uh, in the end, they settled. They settled, and uh, the agreement was um, this guy agreed to uh, collaborate with the company to go after the other wrongdoers in the supply chain. So this is something that actually meets what the company really wants beyond just money. And for this guy, he also gets to you know avoid a lengthy lawsuit that will cost him quite a lot of money as well, and uh, he avoids going to court. So that's what I mean by uh, fashioning flexible and creative solutions that go beyond just the payment of money. And that's very important during this period because the money can be quite tight sometimes. And um, you want to preserve relationships, especially during this COVID period, where it's really nobody's fault that things are happening. And uh, I think that for some contractors, sometimes uh, I do want to contract with my supplier because uh, I know that he can always give me the correct diameter nut that I want. I don't really want to just, uh, due to a dispute during this period, things go bad and I find a new supplier. And next time, I'm not even sure whether this person is a good partner. So it's important because mediation, I mean, we call it tiao tie in Mandarin, right? And uh, you are able to just uh, create harmony and coexist together in the future. And mediation is also very flexible. Uh, you can use it alone or you can use it in combination with litigation or arbitration. So you mediate, if it works, that's good. If it doesn't work, you can still go on to arbitration. And uh, you are often quite clear or clearer about the issues that you have had uh, before you tried mediation in the first place. And uh, the last point is really the strong point I'm trying to put forward, which is that during this period, you know, take the time to try to negotiate your dispute, try to mediate your dispute, and put it aside so that when things blow over and things improve, you are not bogged down by all these legal battles, but you are in a good position to recover from this uh, economic gloom that may come about. So maybe I'll just spend some time now talking about the SIMC COVID-19 protocol. So essentially, it's just really a service that uh, uh, we have provided to the business community to allow them to use businesses, uh, to use mediation, uh, in a way that's uh, not expensive, fairly fast, and also very effective. So what, what is this protocol? Uh, well, three words, expedited, economical, and effective. By expedited, we provide for you to file your case online. So you just go to our website, you can click, you fill in the form, and we'll be in touch with you to figure out uh, how you want to run the case, where to hold the mediation, and when and how. And we can do it all within 10 days. And uh, during this period, there are quite a lot of issues with like flying in, flying out, uh, especially for cross-border disputes, but that's okay because uh, we are also able to do this online for you. So in the picture that you saw earlier, uh, we had the lawyers in Singapore, but we had their clients dialing in from overseas. And uh, SIMC was around to arrange all of that. And economical because, um, we are really not trying to do this to uh, make money, so to speak, but it really is supposed to um, help everybody to get back on their feet and put disputes behind them. And so uh, we have spoken to our mediators for like special rates. And uh, later on, I'll take you through, but uh, we've got a system of like tiered and cap fixed fee structure that makes it, I think, uh, quite transparent and attractive for parties to think about using mediation. And uh, for effectiveness, We've, well, we've got a panel of, I think, um, over 70 uh, mediators from 17 jurisdictions and uh, many more. And uh, for online mediation, we are able to offer you end-to-end uh, -end case management support so that uh, when you go for the dispute and mediate it, all you need to worry about is just, you know, discussing your issues and trying to settle. Don't need to worry about whether you are logging on, logging off, connectivity issues and all that. We, we take care of all of that. And uh, the last point is enforceability. So I mentioned earlier that maybe 78 in 10 of cases get resolved. And if you want to, for example, you can go on to the Mediation Act and record your agreement as a court judgment. And that allows you to ensure the other party can keep to the terms of the agreement, uh, even in the future. So uh, I already touched on this, but uh, very briefly how it works, right? So online filing, the fee is kept at 250. Uh, Pre-mediation preparation will help you to select the mediator. Uh, we'll uh, inform you and explain to you about how the mediation is gonna work. So especially for online mediation, I understand that it's quite new to some people, to some of us. 
but that's okay. So uh, we actually have a briefing with you to walk you through uh, how that's supposed to work before the mediation. And uh, number three, when it actually happens, uh, we are also there to support you. And uh, the way that it works online, we have tried to make it similar to, on, to offline because uh, uh, we want to make sure that it's equally effective whether you're mediating uh, online or face-to-face -face in person. And for uh, post-mediation follow-up, uh, e-signature, and sometimes people don't resolve on the spot. Maybe they don't have the authority to say yes to a particular amount at this point in time, but they'll go back and check their CEO and they'll come back again. So we help to arrange for that kind of thing also. So that's what I meant by end-to-end -end case management services. Yeah, so I think to a lot of us, this is a quite important thing. So the fee schedule. So if you look at the table on the left, uh, we have found that for dispute value, and that's for two parties, uh, the combined value, below one million, we have fixed the total fee payable at $3,000 per party. Then for the second tier, as you go to like say one to five million, uh, you are looking at 0.3% of the dispute value, and the maximum that you will pay for this range is 6.5K per party. So I think the break even point is maybe about 2.2 million. So if your dispute value is about 2.2 million, uh, you are looking to pay something like 6.5K uh, to get the mediation done. And uh, I think the perhaps the most attractive thing about this uh, protocol is that for super high value disputes, say above like 8 million, you are just paying like $10,000 per party flat, no matter what. So uh, that's what we are offering to the parties and uh, we received quite a few requests so far and um, we are just hoping that uh, this is one way to encourage parties to you know, make the most of this period to try to resolve the disputes with their cherished partners, your long-standing partners and uh, try and put things behind you. And uh, one important point is the, you know, this very, very important statute in Singapore that I think Colin can touch on later. This is the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. And we've designed this protocol to, uh, in a way, interface uh, very smoothly with the app so that if you are in a dispute, you can mediate at any time, even if you're using the app, before, during, and after. So under the app, for example, if there's a dispute, you may be going to the assessor. But even after the ruling of the assessor, you can still mediate. So I think that it's important to try to, you know, resolve things during this period. And... Uh, in a way that's also like not, not so expensive and also quick and fast and also effective. And uh, I already spoken about this, but uh, this is a difficult period to uh, meet sometimes, especially for international disputes. Uh, and that's why uh, we provide for online mediation as part of our protocol. So you can still mediate online or hybrid mode and uh, we make sure that things are safe and secure. Okay, with that, uh, I think I'll pass the mic over to Colin and uh, who can explain to you more about the act. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, especially on the explanation of the new SIMC COVID-19 protocol and yeah. how it is designed to complement the new COVID-19 act. This is definitely something companies should consider to resolve the disruptions that they may encounter due to uh, COVID-19. Um, next, I would like to invite Colin to present Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you have been keeping safe and healthy during this uh, COVID pandemic. I am talking about, to you about this COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. It is a, a, a massive act and I have about 15 minutes to go through, so I shall try to be very focused. Um, but feel free to, to ask me questions at the, the end of the presentation. There are three things that I do want to cover today. The first thing is um, to go through some of the background about um, why we did this. Um, I will then explain how parties can get relief under the Act. And the last part is I, I, I will explain how this thing actually works it on the ground through a case study. Okay. Um, in terms of background, I, I do want us to try and look back at how this COVID pandemic um, panned out. If we go back, 
The first case to hit Singapore shores came up sometime in late January after Chinese New Year. By February, there were the, the disruptions in the global supply chain and especially to our export markets was significant enough that it led to a downgrade of the GDP forecast by MTI. But even at that time, we still did not know the full impact and full extent of what COVID um, would do to our economy and to society. I mean, in February, you will recall that um, on the day Dorscon Orange was, was uh, declared, people rushed to buy toilet paper of all things. So even, I mean, that seems a lifetime away now. Um, but what has been clear is that since January, February, March, the safe distancing measures, the disruptions to economy, the way we do work has had a huge impact on uh, uh, our economy. F&B retail sectors particularly um, hit badly. Now, in, in that context, um, back in March, April, when, we, when we, me and my team, we, start, we embarked on working on this bill, we asked ourselves, what is the one key thing that was going to keep businesses going? Now, in, in, I think in March, there was the first budget. Um, and even then, I think there was already some support measures, about six billion, slightly less than that was uh, in support measures was given. In April, at that time, the government was already planning a second round of support measures. But still, businesses were suffering. Um, contracts couldn't be performed, not through anyone's fault, but really because of measures adopted by our government and government overseas to restrict movements, um, not just of people, but of goods as well. So for instance, in a construction industry in Singapore, which is heavily dependent on supply, um, supplies from China, manpower from Malaysia, they were severely disrupted. Even things as seemingly trivial, like wedding events, wedding banquets, they couldn't go on because of the safe distancing measures and later on the circuit breakers. So wedding couples were saying, what am I going to do? I, I, I paid huge amounts in deposits for these weddings, which now um, cannot go on. The contracts by their terms says that any cancellation for any reason, um, I don't get a refund. So people up and down through all different sectors of society, segments of society were affected by COVID. And we felt that if we allowed um, the strict enforcement of legal rights and obligations, there would be great disruption to the, the, to the economy and the way we did things. Oh, but why, why intervene? Um, we, the, the team here, uh, the ministers, and also the, the private sector committee who we consulted uh, uh, with on this bill, were all very cognizant that Singapore is a country and a jurisdiction where rule of law is paramount. And by rule of law, we mean that we don't easily or, or, or um, flippantly intervene in private contractual arrangements entered into uh, between willing parties. We don't do so lightly at all, but we, we consider the, the trade-offs. Now, if we didn't intervene now, what would happen? Parties will insist on strict legal rights, sue each other, even however fast our Singapore courts are, however fast SIAC is, um, you, you're going to have a long tail of disputes. And to what end? If, you know, uh, businesses have no revenue, no money to pay, a lot of businesses are going to end up in insolvency. Right, and you, then your capital, your productive assets all get locked up in litigation, in insolvency proceedings, and it's going to be even more difficult for the economy to recover. So in terms of the greater good, um, the government decided that it was necessary for us to intervene, but uh, we are very cautious to make sure that uh, the interventions were limited. So what we did at the end of the day is to a very targeted protection. The Act only applies to the, the categories of contracts which are included in the schedule to the Act. And the temporary relief applies for six months from the time the, the Act came into force. So it's basically 20th April to 19th of October. 
Um, that period can be extended to up to one year, uh, but that hasn't been decided yet. We'll just move on. So I'll move on to the second part to explain how the act actually works. There are four things, I, uh, uh, main points, which I, I hope you take away from this part. First is what contracts are covered. Second, um, the mechanics or, or steps to take to get relief under the Act. The third part is um, what, in fact, are the reliefs, so you know. And the fourth thing is a, a brief explanation of the assessment uh, procedure. On the first um, part about what contracts are covered, Generally, the, the schedule of the Act has currently about um, seven or eight main categories of contracts. I'll just quickly run through them. Um, there are the secured loans to SMEs, higher purchase agreements relating to commercial equipment, rental agreements relating to commercial equipment as well, leases for non-residential uh, properties. Now, just stopping at uh, the, the, the fourth one. So you can see that the four categories here all are very business centric to try and help businesses affected by COVID deal with the, the disputes um, relating to their main the, the contracts um, in, in the ordinary course of business. The fifth category we have are property purchases from developers, but not resale properties. Um, the sixth uh, category is events and tourism related contracts. And the seventh one, which I think is uh, the, the audience will be most interested in today, is construction contracts. So those are the seven main categories uh, covered um, by the Act. Now, additionally, there are other requirements. Um, the contract must be entered into before 25th March 2020. The idea is that if you enter in a contract after 25th March, when COVID was already a big issue and everyone should know about the impact of COVID, um, then we take it that you enter with your eyes wide open as to uh, the, you know, how, how COVID will impact the way you carry out your contract. So we will not intervene in those arrangements. Secondly, um, it must be for relief and obligation to be performed after 1st February 2020. So for instance, if you, if you can't pay your rent from before February in January 2020, we think that uh, generally that probably wasn't um, impacted by COVID. You probably had some other financial difficulty impacting you. So it's not fair for us to intervene um, when you can't perform a, 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 an obligation before 1st February 2020. And lastly, you must show that your contractual obligation could not be performed due to COVID-19 and not for some other reason. Second part, what must you actually do to get relief? Um, the reliefs under the Act do not take effect automatically. Uh, the affected party must, serve, must first serve a notification for relief on the other party. Um, this can be done online um, through a form that we have on our website. If for whatever reason you can't do it online because you don't have a sing pass or cop pass or you don't have the other side's email or something like that, you can also download the form and serve it manually. Okay. Once the, the notification for relief or what we like to call the NFR has been served on the other party, that's when the, the reliefs under the Act will automatically apply. Okay, they, so the, the moratorium applies until the NFR is set aside or uh, until the parties uh, agree otherwise. So, so what are the reliefs? Um, first, generally, to all contracts, there is a temporary moratorium against certain legal actions. Um, basically, this is uh, uh, enforcement and legal actions uh, in relation to the um, obligation which you cannot perform due to COVID. The, the reason why we put this in is because we wanted a legal circuit breaker. If you have been impacted by COVID, we don't want the other party to start, you know, suing you, sending letters of demand, threatening termination, uh, you know, uh, doing all these things to distract from what we think is the proper way to get out of this situation, which is to work together, explain how COVID has impacted you, explain and work together to try and resolve that difficulty to make sure that parties um, uh, can carry on with their business. Uh, and in a way which, um, you know, ensures that businesses all survive together. 
All right, so we call it a, a legal circuit breaker. It applies to all contracts. Um, in relation to, to uh, construction contracts, though, I, I do want to say that we, we did um, realize that adjudication proceedings in at least the construction sector are a sui generis type of legal proceeding. It is critical to ensure um, that payments are made and things like that. It's not necessarily seen as a dispute resolution mechanism, but it's just part and parcel of the, the, the mechanics of getting payment. So the, the Act doesn't stop um, parties from filing SOPA adjudication um, proceedings. Uh, second, th there are a number of sui generis, meaning specific to um, construction uh, contracts uh, reliefs. Um, the, the first one here is for performance bond. So the Act says that um, calling on a performance bond earlier than seven days before the date of expiry is not allowed. The defaulting party or the affected party, basically the contractor, can apply to the bank to extend the term of the performance bond to 26 October 2020, which is seven days after the end of the prescribed period, or such other date as may be agreed between the parties. This is essentially because you know you, you can't be sued or you know, they can't commence any enforcement actions during the prescribed period. But if you don't allow them to do that and the employer can't call on a performance bond, then the employer, the employer might be um, severely disadvantaged. So we included this so that the, the, um, the performance bond can be extended to cover the period, the entire period of the, the moratorium. Okay. Next, um, we also gave relief for delays and breaches caused by COVID. There are two parts to this. The first part says that for the purposes of determining the period of delay in performance when calculating the liquidated damages payable or assessing other um, delay damages, the period where the subject inability subsists between 1st of February to 19th October 2020 is disregarded. The next part is for breaches. So where a party is unable to supply goods or services as contractually required due to COVID-19 between 1st February to 19th of October 2020, the fact that such inability was due to COVID-19 is a defense to a claim for a breach of contract in respect of that inability. Essentially, these two parts together creates a statutory defense against claims for breach of uh, claims of breach or delay when these are caused by COVID. And this defense is to be raised by the contractor in the adjudication, arbitration, or in court proceedings if the matter is litigated. But this does not affect any judgment, arbitral award, or adjudication. Uh, my fourth and last point is about assessors. Our objective was to create a cheap, quick, and fast way for parties to resolve any disagreements about the NFR. Remember, the, the whole point of this is to avoid parties getting into long-drawn court proceedings. So we didn't want any disagreements about the NFR to, to, to go into uh, litigation or arbitration proceedings that will last for months or years. So we created a panel of assessors and parties can apply to assessors who will, who will give um, what Minister has called Banyan Tree Justice, uh, quick and rough, He'll look at what is just and equitable in the circumstances of the case. No need to go and look at what are the detailed legal arguments or detailed facts. We'll look at what is fair in that case. Okay. Let me just move to case study, the last part of my presentation. The, the brief facts of the case study, which I want to, to um, explain to you, is, is this. Um, the contractor and subcontractor entered an agreement in March 2019, so it's covered under the Act. The subcontractor was supposed to supply and install um, duct works. The contractor's position is that COVID-19 has severely disrupted the flow of materials and labour and impacted work progress. And because of the lower collection of progress payments um, that has impacted its cash flow, the contractor simply doesn't have the cash flow to make payment to the subcontractor. Therefore, put in a, a FR. The subcontractor is of the view that the contractor can make payment. Uh, the subcontractor already obtained an adjudication determination in its favour, which it wants to enforce. It also wants to take action against the contractor under the contract. 
The subcontractor claims that it has been badly affected by the contractor's failure to make payment as well, but everyone has been affected. So the contractor filed the NFR and the subcontractor as they wanted to defer the payment of the amount stated in the adjudication determination for six months. Now, what was the outcome? Um, this was brought before the assessor. The assessor said that this is basically one of those classical paradigm situations which apply, where the act will apply. The subcontractor was not allowed to take any action described in section 5.3 of the, the act. Basically, this is the, the legal circuit breaker which I talked about just now. Um, but this, but the assessor looked very carefully at the financial uh, statements of the contractor and felt that it was fair that the legal circuit breaker only lasted to 1st September 2020 to give the contractor some time to get its affairs into order and, and, um, and to, to, hand, uh, to manage its cash flow issues. And that after 1st September um, 2020, it should make payment. Otherwise, the subcontractor will be at liberty to take whatever enforcement actions it wants after that. So the, the Act does give some flexibility to ensure that whatever legal circuit breaker we give, whatever relief we give to the affected parties is also fair to the other party, to the other side, based on the circumstances in the, in the precise case. Um, and and um, I think that, that neatly um, illustrates how the entire act is supposed to, to uh, work. In Closing, I just wanted to make one observation. I know that this webinar is about dispute resolution for construction contracts, and Michelle and Julian have explained two very important ways in which um, disputes can be resolved. I just want to say that the Act, our Act, doesn't help resolve any disputes. What it does is it creates a, a system where it gives parties time and space. And during this COVID pandemic, to avoid suing each other and, and doing things which are not necessarily productive so that they can work together to go and deal with a, this situation which no one actually um, anticipated and which no one really knows um, how to deal with because the impact is, is not fully known yet. So I, I see a lot of very eminent firms and companies uh, represented in the audience today. I just hope that you, you take some of what I've said away, understand that everyone has been impacted everyone's cash flow is impacted. I hope that everyone will treat each other fairly. If you cannot work it out through negotiations, do consider Julian's um, mediation frameworks and, and the mediation services uh, and, and try to, to come to a uh, mutually acceptable outcome. So uh, that, that's what I wanted to, to share with you today. Jeffrey? Thank you, Colin, for the... Uh summary of the act and also to share on the case study for a recent filing. I believe that this is uh, invaluable to our attendees today. Um, and companies could definitely take reference from the case studies um, if they are facing similar issues. Um, before we proceed on to the uh, panel discussions, uh, we are launching a short poll for the attendees. So please uh, respond to the uh, poll in your own time. Um, we will close the poll 10 minutes later and we will discuss the results um, right before we end the um, webinar. Um, I would also like to remind the audience that if you have um, any questions, uh, please utilize the uh, Q&A um, function. We will proceed on to the uh, next segment of our webinar today. Um, I would like to kick off the uh, panel discussion um, by asking Colin a few questions. So Colin, you, you gave a broad summary of the uh, COVID-19 Act um, and it provides temporary relief for parties if they have suffered from uh, COVID-19 uh, related disruptions. So what happens if these uh, disruptions persist beyond the prescribed period of uh, 19 October this year? Well, Jeffrey, um, we, we are all worried about when this COVID pandemic will end. Um, the Act currently gives relief for disruptions suffered up to 19 of October 2020 for construction contracts. I did mention earlier that the Act does give the Minister flexibility to extend the prescribed period for another six months for a total of up to a year. 
Uh, but a, a decision hasn't been made about that yet. But the, we are monitoring the situation. This was always the intention, to put in a legal circuit breaker so that everyone has time and space to, to study uh, and to consider what are the next appropriate steps, including for the government. And the situation is so fluid, as, as everyone knows. So what I can say is that MinLaw and other agencies across government are monitoring the, the situation very closely. Uh, we have reached out our feelers to, to get some ground sensing to see what additional steps, additional measures might be needed uh, by the industry. Uh, and we will see what needs to be done post 19th of October. Uh, but that said, I, I do want to say that, you know, whatever measures we, relief measures we, we come up with will be implemented across the board. Um, so in, instead of relying on, on government's relief, uh, parties should just use this time before 19th of October to try and work out solutions that are suitable for themselves, rather than whatever solutions that government may or may not uh, come up with, with uh, in October. You know, work out something that, that works for you uh, and use the mediation framework to, to help you reach that um, mutually acceptable solution if you need to. So, um, so a question that we have uh, come across uh, in previous uh, webinars that, so if a company may suffer from uh, COVID-19 disruptions, um, which resulted in their existing contracts to be unsustainable. So for example, um, their cost structure may have increased tremendously and uh, hence resulting in an unprofitable contract. So in such a case, right, could a company utilize the uh, COVID-19 Act to perhaps terminate their contract and, and walk away without any further penalties? The short answer is no. Um, the, the Act does not interfere or intervene in, in the contract in that way. It doesn't change the terms of the contract relating to termination. It doesn't give you additional termination rights. Um, if the contract in, in, in the situation you described has a force majeure clause, the parties can rely on that. Um, but no, no the, the Act doesn't otherwise intervene in that way. You know, that, that's it. Like I, I want to emphasize again, parties are free to negotiate. Um, if one party's cost of labor or, or other materials has risen tremendously uh, and it is really no longer possible or practical to expect the contract to be carried out, does it make sense to insist that the contract, uh, con contractor perform strictly in accordance with the contract? I mean, it will simply drive the contractor to financial ruin. And then you will have a hard time unwinding that, the, that the project um, and the contract as well. On the contractor side, is it fair to pass on all the additional costs and risk to the developer? I mean, the developer probably has the contract terms on its side. So really, at the end of the day, this is not a simple situation to work out. Um, and, and that's why the Act doesn't even attempt to try and, and work out what it, how each of these uh, contracts should be unraveled. We have bought parties time and space to try and work things out themselves. And they should really talk constructively to each other instead of engaging in, in this disputes. You know, a, a lot of uh, resources are already very stretched. So rather than, you know, fighting each other, enriching the lawyers, really it should be used to talk productively and try and work, work the, the contract situation out. Thank you, Colin. Um, next, I have a question for Michelle. Um, so Michelle, um, has case administrations and uh, hearings at SIAC been affected because of the COVID-19 uh, measures? Um, actually, no, it's business as usual at SIAC. So what we have been doing uh, is a lot of our staff have been telecommuting during this period. And what we have done is to issue uh, like COVID-19 FAQ to advise parties how they can continue to file cases with us uh, in the event that they cannot settle their disputes um, via mediation, uh, and also how awards can continue to be issued. So, um, the benefit of arbitration is, is very flexible. And so um, arbitration hearings have continued to be heard um, virtually via Zoom platforms or even WebEx. And that's the, the advantage of and beauty of arbitration. So has, has there been a marked increase in uh, case load since uh, March? Um, has SIAC handled like any dispute resolution cases arising from the uh, COVID-19 uh, disruptions? We've seen a couple of cases um, relating to COVID-19 disputes and um, there's also been a 
increase in cases that we have seen year on year as well. Thank you. Um, so, Julian, how has the response been in regards to the new uh, co SIMC COVID-19 protocol? Um, which are the industries or sectors that have been more receptive of this uh, new uh, protocol? Thanks, Jeffrey, for the question. Um, I think in terms of the response to the protocol, so I think both locally and internationally, uh, it's been good. Uh, we've had quite a lot of queries on the protocol, uh, how it's being used. Uh, and we are also in talks with uh, various partners around the world uh, on whether they want to put out something similar. Because uh, I think this point was something that Colin also pointed out, which is that everybody's affected by COVID-19 and uh, nobody's completely sure uh, about the full impact yet. So uh, given all this uncertainty, uh, it's quite important to have something that uh, you can just quickly dispose of the matter. Uh, and so it's been quite a good response. And uh, on your other point, uh, I think the question was about um, the kind of disputes uh, that are amenable for mediation. Uh, I think the short answer has to be that uh, all kinds. <laughs> but um, really, I, 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 I think that uh, it is a fact that you can mediate almost all kinds of disputes, right? Maybe some criminal matters you don't because you must go to a court of law for that. Uh, but I think the question is that, uh, I will turn it around and just ask myself this question, right? Do you have a problem right now? And if you do, do you want to settle that problem quickly and in a way that's uh, not very expensive and also effectively? If the answer is yes, uh, you might want to think about ADR, whether it's arbitration or uh, mediation. And uh, maybe then the correct question then is to really ask, um, what are the factors that will make my mediation succeed? Because uh, I've met some uh, lawyers, uh, some uh, client side people, and uh, they're not completely sure uh, uh, why they don't succeed in the mediation. And I think that there are some factors here, and uh, who you choose as a mediator is very important. Uh, and I think the role of lawyers is also very, very important, especially during this period. Uh, I think if you are a business, you expect your legal counsel to give you like a uh, all the options and uh, help, you this, help you to understand uh, why is the kind of um, uh, uh, weapon that you need, you know, to go to the kind of battle that you are fighting. So uh, invariably in, uh, during this period, we think that the weapon of choice is mediation. And uh, so the role of lawyers is very, very important. If lawyers don't persuade their clients about mediation, they will not know its benefits. Uh, and if clients don't know about it, uh, if, even if they mediate, they will not be in the right frame of mind to try to settle their problems via mediation. So uh, that's all very important. Thank you, Julian. Um, we have a couple of questions from the floor here, um, and I would just like to uh, go through some of these. Um, so we have a question from, at, um, you know, uh, which is directed to Colin. So, so Colin, on the liquidated damages provision in the COVID-19 Act, if a contractor was uh, affected by uh, a COVID-19 related event before his uh, original completion date is due, um, that is to say no liquidated uh, damages has accrued yet. So, you know, does this mean that the LD provision will not apply um, to th such a case? Okay, so how it works is this. Um, I, I, I use a hypothetical. So for instance, you have a com uh, project completion date sometime next year, maybe say June 2021. Um, your project isn't done yet, so you don't actually know what the full extent of your liquidated damages might be. What this act is meant to do is this. Knowing that you probably are already impacted by COVID in terms of you, you, know, you have suffered delays and things like that, you put in your notification for relief serve it on the, the, the employer or the main contractor or as the case may be, that, that entitles you to raise the argument, the statutory defense later on if there is a dispute about what the, the uh, liquidated damages, what the delay damages might be. So you, you put in the NFR now, but later on when you settle whatever the LDs are, the EOT and whatnot, not if there's a dispute about how much, um, uh, how much the the COVID has impacted you, you you can you can rely on the section six, I think, uh, at that point in time. So you put it in the NFR now, but you settle the the delay damages later. 
But if you don't put in your NFR now, you're not entitled to raise the argument later on. Thank you, Colin. Um, we, we actually have an, a, a question um, asking about the cost of uh, mediation and arbitration for a dispute amounting to about, let's say, 300k. So maybe Michelle and Julian, you could just give a rough uh, ballpark, you know, for, for such a case amounting to 200,000, um, how much would it cost to mediate or to arbitrate? Well, I guess uh, if you're talking about mediation as a standalone, so you're using only mediation, then uh, under the protocol, uh, if you go back to the chart uh, that I shared earlier, uh, below 1 million, you are looking at a flat 3K uh, per party. And uh, the other point is that uh, I understand that uh, disputes, right, they come in all shapes and sizes. So to the extent that they don't fit into the three tiers, uh, maybe in terms of like the requirements of the client, for example, they want to pick their own mediator, they want to hold it in a hotel, you know. So uh, we welcome people to come to us and uh, we can explain to them. And uh, for these cases, uh, we can discuss on the rates. So that's how we are doing it now. So uh, I, I know it's not one size fits all, uh, but uh, that's why uh, uh, um, we have a three-tiered structure, but, and that's why we also uh, keep our lines open to uh, our customers. Mm. Uh, Michelle? So the filing fees for like, um, our case is $3,140 for Singapore parties. Um, if the mediation is unsuccessful, there will um, administration fees for the arbitration will apply. And um, for a 200,000 dispute, Hundred thousand, a summon dispute for about two hundred thousand. The uh, cap on the arbitration fees will be about twenty five thousand dollars. And so it depends on when your your arbitration actually completes. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so just one more question from the uh, Q and A that I'm seeing here. So it's a rather, uh, it's a general question. So I'll open up. Uh, to all all the uh, panelists, so you know, if let's say force merger will cause you know has caused the uh, construction activity to be stagnant, right? Um, but the machinery suppliers you know continue to charge a rental fee, um, and the user right they will argue therefore you know because of you know uh, it's it's COVID related they can't use their stock from being using this uh, this machineries. So in this case, you know, what can the supplier do? I think you have to look at your contract and if there's a force merger clause, you will see the, whether the, the COVID-19 that's uh, specifically refers to uh, whether the force merger clause has a pandemic, refers to pandemic or, and then you can try to argue that COVID-19, I mean, if this has been defined by the World Health Organization as a pandemic and so um, whatever relief that is provided in your contract, you can claim it. And so in order to claim the relief, you would actually need to commence arbitration if there's an arbitration clause in your contract, if not um, commence court proceedings. So to supplement what Michelle said, uh, yeah, I think in general, people look at the contract and they look at the surrounding law, uh, maybe the COVID-19 Act to see whether it says anything about this and so on, and uh, the court cases. Uh, but actually during this period, we realized that there are some contracts where everything is black and white, but yet there's a lot of gray areas. So in these cases, uh, we always encourage uh, parties to consider uh, friendly negotiation or mediation to try to resolve the dispute. Uh, because I think one important point is that even if you wait until uh, uh, the measures expire and you go to court, you file your case in court, and even if you win, um, I'm not quite sure the other party is good for the money, given the uh, pressures of this period. So, you know, why fight? So uh, that really has been uh, what uh, we're trying to explain uh, to our partners, uh, lawyers and clients and otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, so we, we have concluded the poll just a while ago um, and we are sharing the results of the poll on your screen right now. So for this poll, right, we have actually asked the same questions during our last two seminars, uh, webinars in April and June. And we thought it might be interesting to track the sentiments for today's session. So, so from the previous webinars, we, we found that 29% of the attendees right, shared that they have encountered disputes uh, in their projects and that 22% um, of the attendees um, intend to utilize COVID-19 Act um, to manage the disputes. So for today, right, um, from the poll results, we are seeing a, a similar um, 
percentage, uh, 22 percent of the attendees have encountered disputes. Um, but it seems like uh, a, a greater number today, um, they, they have decided that, you know, they will be utilizing the COVID-19 Act. It's 62 percent today. Um, while around, I, I think, 20 odd percent, you know, they will be looking at either the original contracts or, or using alternative uh, um, uh, dispute resolutions uh, method. So, um, Colin, what do you have to say about this? I, um, uh, I have two things. I'm glad that I've <laughs> explained it and, and in a way which makes the act look good and attractive. <laughs> but I do, I do want to emphasize, emphasize my second point, which is really that the, the, the act is not the panacea, it's not the medicine. It's really the bandage to stop the bleeding. It is really the, 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 the precursor to the actual medicine, which is really your negotiation, your mediation, or your arbitration. It puts in, uh, you know, this, this temporary measures to allow parties time and space to work it out. But the assessors will not work it out for you. Um, it is for the parties themselves to try and, and, and resolve it. So I, I mean, the, the way that the, the, the question is phrased could be quite broad. I hope that the 22% will use the act to buy themselves time when they need it. They should. Um, but then do focus your energies then on, on trying to work things out with the other contracting party and get external help through mediators, through arbitrators, if, if you need it. Maybe I'll come in here as well, Jeffrey. Uh, well, I can't agree more with what Colleen has said. And uh, I understand the question is asking people to choose between one or the other. But I think in reality, uh, uh, you're supposed to use the COVID-19 Act to stop the bleeding for a while. And then you're supposed to use the time wisely to try to find a way to cure yourself. And uh, as for that cure, it can be negotiation, arbitration, mediation, whatever. But it probably is a good idea to use this breathing space to uh, take a check uh, on proceedings and try to figure out the best way forward so you can navigate out of the problems together better and stronger. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Jalyn. Um, so we, we, we have uh, one more question in the poll, right, that, um, that we have asked. Um, that you know, if whether they have, uh, the attendees have experienced delays in their project and do they intend to use COVID-19 to manage the disputes and have they served the notification of relief? So 26% have indicated yes um, and 44% indicated that they have not. Um, do, you, do you have any advice, you know, for these people? Any additional advice beyond what you have just mentioned? My, my advice for the 44% the who intend to do so before the end of the prescribed period is that, you, yes, I, the, the act is, is there. Um, what I would suggest is not, not to allow things to become too heated or too antagonistic before you invoke it. In our experience, we have seen some cases, not a lot, but we have seen some, seen, we have seen some cases where the other party takes offense when a party, um, when the affected party files or serves the notification for relief, in that it is seen as a uh, step away from negotiations. Like you're bringing a third party, uh, invoking the act against me, you're not genuine about um, negotiating. So what I would say is use the act, but use it in a judicious, and also sensitive manner. Um, it's there to lead to constructive um, uh, results. But if you say, no, I, I'm going to use this, I'm going to get assessor to come in to side with me, I'm going to write to Min Law, and Min Law is going to tell you that you know you can't all do the, all these things to me, then that will not uh, lead to a fruitful or beneficial result. So th that's the advice I would have to the 44% who, who are considering using the act. Um, thank you, uh, Colin. So we, we are actually coming to the end of our webinar today. 
And I would just like to uh, get the panelists to share with us uh, any of their ending remarks. Um, Michelle, perhaps. The COVID-19 Act has its limitations. Uh, it only applies to domestic arbitration act. So there's the moratorium doesn't apply to international arbitration act. So if you have an international party involved in your construction contract, you should um, review your, your contractual um, rights and obligations and decide whether or not um, with maybe negotiating and mediation meeting that doesn't work, you might want to consider commencing arbitration and seeking the, the relevant declaration relief um, from the arbitrator. Um, Julie? Mm, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, I think I'll just go back to the earlier point that I was making, and uh, that is that um, if you have a dispute, really try to settle it early before it gets worse, and uh, before it becomes more and more disputes. And uh, sometimes things are very fact sensitive, so it's not possible for Colin, uh, Michelle, or myself to uh, give too much detail uh, on uh, the particular instances that uh, some of the questions uh, in the audience have posed. But I would say that everything is very fact sensitive. And if it's not clear, uh, why not try to uh, mediate first? So you try to mediate and settle it. If it doesn't work, then there's always uh, other ways to resolve the dispute. But maybe you should try to make mediation your first part of call. Thank you. Colin. I just wanted to use this time to just clarify one, because I saw one question, uh, which is quite important. The question was whether you need to put in the NFR before 19th of October. Uh, to enjoy the relief under the Act. Yes, you must put in the NFR, otherwise the reliefs in the Act don't apply to you. So if you want the reliefs, please put in your NFR. Uh, that, that's all I wanted to share. Um, you, you have, I, I sense that there are many questions about the Act. I think you're going to share my email or our contact particulars. So please feel free to, to write in and we will um, attend to them as, as best as we can. Yeah, I have one more point actually, and uh, this came up for discussions with uh, some of our clients. So when they think they have a dispute, uh, they think that their position is very clear, their case is very strong. But sometimes uh, it really isn't the case. So talk to your lawyer, take a step back, think about all the options, because this is a very important period for all of us. You may think that you can't uh, do any work now, but maybe your contract is like a seven-year project and not a one-year project. So when it's like that, uh, the the extent to which you can argue force majeure is also different. So I think always just discuss and try to come to friendly terms. Thank you. Um, thank you, Colin and Julian. So um, lastly, we would like to request for the attendees to respond to our feedback poll. Um, I would also like to thank our three panelists for spending time with us this afternoon. And of course, to thank our attendees for, our, for, for your great list of uh, insightful questions. So we still do have a number of questions that um, have, we, are, we have not been able to answer them. Um, so on our part, we will collaborate with the panelists and uh, thereafter we will share the uh, answers with all the attendees. So um, just to share with uh, everyone, so we will be organizing a webinar on uh, building business resilience and seizing new opportunities from new tech infrastructure on the 14th of July. Um, so you may find out more about this webinar from the SBF website. So we, we will be sharing the presentation and the recordings of the webinar uh, with all attendees. And then lastly, if any of you would like to find out about the uh, SBF infrastructure committee or to join our interest group, um, please scan the QR code on this slide. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.